What's going on guys? Welcome back to the channel. Samuel Richards here, Common Sense Bodybuilding. And today we're going to be talking about an issue which really brought a lot of you guys to the channel. That's right, we're going to be diving into SARM, Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators, Pro-Hormones, Tercesterone, all the anabolic agents that have been commonly used by people as a stepping stone into the world of anabolics. What do I think about them? Do I think they're any good? Do I think they're worth it? And what kind of experiences have I had with them that shaped my opinion? Well, today I'm going to be giving you the update, my honest, raw opinion. So without further ado, let's get into it. So for those of you who are new to the channel potentially, or maybe you don't know about my history of Psalms, I'm going to give you a brief rundown. A few years ago, as a stepping stone into the world of anabolics, I used RAD140, which is a selective androgen receptor modulator. One of the slightly more powerful, but, uh, you know, really, really effective versions of Psalms, to be honest, in the grand scheme of things, when you compare it to the milder compounds such as Ostrin. Uh, and I also utilize GW, which was Cardarin, which uh, basically helps with athletic performance, changes the way that your body consumes or burns fat. Uh, so I utilized these both for about a sort of, I think uh, an eight week cycle. Uh, and then I utilized Rad140 alongside my first ever testosterone cycle. That was for a more extended period of time, about 10 weeks, uh, which as you may know, if you were around the channel at that time, didn't go too well in extended use, sort of started to play havoc with my system a little bit. Generally speaking, the results were okay. I think I gained between sort of eight to 10 pounds on each cycle. Um, you know, can't really complain about that. It was consistent. Um, the side effect wise, I didn't feel too many negative side effects. Uh, mainly it was just the suppression issue, which is something which I've covered in great detail. You can check out my suppression video here, which talks about the different types of suppression, how they can affect you and what you can do about it. Um, obviously those issues were less pronounced when I used it alongside testosterone, but still it, it's not the great, greatest feeling being on SOMS. You know, if you've entered the world of anabolic androgenic steroids, then you know those compounds that just don't feel healthy. And after my experiences, you know, I can kind of relate that Psalms are one of those compounds. They do not generally feel healthy to be on. They feel like they're quite harsh in the system. Um, now, blood work didn't really show through too detrimental, but still, even so, um, it wasn't the best experience of my life in anabolics. So they work, they don't feel particularly great, but they do the job. So what is my opinion now a couple of years on? Well, now, you know, I've been using anabolic androgenic steroids um, from the point of that first cycle. I dropped Rad 140 out of it, um, mainly for cost reasons. Quite simply, the cost of utilizing stuff like Psalms and now Tecesterone, for example, which has taken hold of, uh, of a lot of the fitness industry, thanks to Greg Doucet and more plates, more dates. Uh, you know, it, it ends up being sky high. I know somebody personally who buys Derek's Tecesterone and his comments were that it is very expensive and he's not quite sure whether it works and neither do they. Have I ever stated that Tercesterone is as effective as testosterone steroids or SARMs? No. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't. As in, that's exactly what it does. Maybe it works for some and maybe not for others. So, it's a gamble, and the same can be said for Psalms. The big issue now, and this is I guess after I've become more educated on anabolics in general, is the safe use model. And to follow the safe use model, uh, there are a few sort of prerequisites. Uh, one of which is that obviously you try and utilize compounds which have got good, solid human research data. We might know that something like an anabolic steroid compound isn't particularly healthy for us, but because of the fact that we have extensive research data because it was used in clinical settings, we're able to establish where that point of sort of low risk reward ratio comes along. Maybe something like Trembolone, using up to 100 milligrams may be effective and may minimize the side effects. Beyond that, maybe we know that it's more dangerous, but we have that clinical benchmark to go from. With Psalms and with stuff like Tercesterone, which are not being utilized for medical uses, um, or at least, you know, a lot of them may be investigated, but a lot of them don't get past trials, much like Cardarin. Uh, due to the fact that it was shown to cause cancer within rats or lead to uh, an increased number of carcinogens. Um, now, yes, you know, again, you know, we're talking non-human trials, which is, you know, you can't extrapolate that directly and say that cardarin is going to cause cancer in humans. But as I said, because of the fact there is no human trials, we can't know for sure. So we have no benchmark of the safety of these compounds, especially stuff like cardarin. Because when the suggestion of cancer comes about, lots of people like to say, well, everything can give you cancer. But the truth of the matter is, 
with such limited studies and research. We actually don't know what could be high causes and low causes. You know, yes, a banana is not going to give you cancer unless you eat, unless you eat 10,000. How many cardarins are going to give you cancer? You've got no clue because nobody does. So that's one of the issues is that there's a lack of human data on these and the fact that they don't make it past medical trials, whereas stuff like, uh, you know, testosterone or primobolin or these kind of compounds have made it through, you know, it, it kind of, it's an initial red flag. So, so far they do a decent job. They don't feel great. That's my sort of anecdotal approach. Um, there's a lack of research and to, uh, to judge the safety of them on. Uh, what are the other concerns or what are my other opinions on this? Well, one of the big issues, as I mentioned, is cost. Um, they cost a hell of a lot for me personally. Doing an eight-week RAD140 cycle would cost me about as much as two testosterone cycles. And on my testosterone cycles, I doubled the results of my RAD140 cycles. So I'm doubling the results there for something which is biologically identical to my natural testosterone. So actually, I, I'd consider testosterone one of the healthiest anabolic agents that you can use versus something which is under-researched, which is twice as expensive and which delivers half the results. So you can see here that the issues are starting to stack up, especially with the fact that if you watch that suppression video, you're gonna feel it if you're just running Rad140 on its own. If you're running testosterone, you won't feel that suppression quite as pronounced. So there are benefits to anabolics, which people may not be willing to accept because in their head, injecting something is far more dangerous, even though the science points to the fact that oral administration of drugs is more often than not extremely harmful compared to injectables. Issue one, lack of research. Issue two is price. Issue three is availability. These things really should not be available to people who have no way of obtaining anabolic androgenic steroids. It's a bit of a con controversial opinion, I suppose, but the issue is a lot of people don't know how to get the health ancillaries that you need to run stuff like SARMs. A lot of people can't get their hands on Novodex, and the reason why they're using SARMs, which are half as effective and double the price, is because they can't source anabolic steroids. A bit of a disclaimer, this is not talking about sourcing anabolic steroids, I'm not going to be guiding you, I don't condone the use of any drugs, but my point of the matter is that, for example, if SARMs act on similar pathways, they don't replace your, your biological testosterone, they don't do that, they don't remove a bit of that feeling of suppression, you're going to need, potentially, something like a HCG, to make sure that your testicles don't atrophy to a, too much of a large extent, which can be damaging over time. You're going to need a PCT, something like Novodex or Clomid. And the issue is here that, you know, plenty of people I see online are desperate to find sources for these, but they simply can't because they haven't thought that far ahead. And the information from a lot of these sites is unreliable because, of course, the things that they're actually trying to peddle for a PCT or as on-cycle support to help you feel better are things which they can legally sell. Because otherwise, what's the point, right? If you can't sell it, why tell them to go and buy something else? And if you advise them to go and get actual drugs, that would be illegal. So these sites are in a bit of a catch-22, but one of the options means that they make quite a lot of money by pretending that stuff like aromatase inhibitors are apt post-cycle therapy. And they spread propaganda throughout online. They try and create reasons why this is okay, and they'll probably try and argue their case everywhere they go. And you see these sites, they give these terrible scientific breakdowns, which are completely incorrect as to why aromatase inhibitors work. They may work at about 5% of what a natural PCT would, but nowhere near adequate enough. So this leads a lot of people to have access to something which is very expensive, which does a pretty terrible job, isn't researched very well, and these people can't get PCTs because they don't have access to that kind of uh, drug, which results in a lot of people with shut down endocrine systems, a lot of people with permanent damage from stuff like SARMs or pro-hormones. And we don't know what tecosterone does yet to a high enough extent to be able to comment on the safety. I personally think that it's a red flag um, to me and I, I'd lump it in with SARMs if I'm honest. The research isn't there. It seems to be mildly effective if it is at all. Um, seems to be better for strength, which yeah, it's gonna help hypertrophy, but how much it helps with uh, the accrual of muscle tissue is yet to be seen. And of course, you know, there are natural limitations to everything. So, you know, say if SARMs can only get you a bit above your natural limit, at least they can do that. But tecosterone seems to be incredibly expensive and mildly effective, if at all. So we're gonna end up in a situation 
whereby you've got lots of people who have got completely fucked up health off the back of these drugs, when in reality they probably have been better off waiting until the point where they could actually properly do anabolic androgenic steroids, had access to health ancillaries, and were able to safely approach a fully designed cycle, which is designed to align with the safer use model anyway, of using the minimum effective dose, using compounds which are well researched, using compounds which are milder, and doing a proper comprehensive PCT at the end of it. I just wanted to clarify my opinion on this because the issue is that they don't seem to have gone away. There seems to be an uprising through stuff like Tercestrone, the next best thing as there always is. And quite simply, just because it's been a little period of time since SARMs came about, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're getting better. It means that new compounds are being made, they may or may not be effective, but because they're new, anyone can spin propaganda about them. There's no scientific literature to combat that. And, you know, they're in this sort of legal gray area. So, of course, they're going to be marketed heavily. And, you know, unfortunately, these compounds still seem to be very popular with young guys. And to me, that's also the worst element of it. You've got young guys without fully developed bodies yet until the point where they're 25. And even that is currently up for debate. People are suggesting maybe it's more like 27 for brain development. But these kind of things do affect brain development. They do affect your physical development. There are intrinsic issues of using these at a young age. And psalms disproportionately are used by people at a young age. I'm very lucky that most of my uh, subscribers and you guys are sort of in a fairly okay category age-wise to be utilizing anabolic compounds. You know, and as much as I understand it's really, really appealing, when you're younger, you don't have access to, you know, to proper drugs, or maybe those drugs feel daunting. They're injected. That's not a nice thing to have to do. Um, I do it every day. And every other day, I inject multiple times. You know, I, I understand it's not pleasant, but once you get over that initial fear, you, you research, you become comfortable with the process. I promise you, you feel much better knowing that you're doing things in the healthiest possible way internally, just because externally it's not the prettiest way. Taking a tablet's convenient, it's easy, but it doesn't mean that it's justified. It doesn't come down to the process of injection being less safe. What it comes down to is the process of, of injection being the best possible way to get that drug into your system and for it to be bioavailable to your system to use. You know, because that's why certain things are injectable versus oral. It's because of how effective they are when they're taken in both ways. It's a reason why testosterone cream, you know, only like 0.1% of it gets absorbed. You know, it's not effective at all because that way of absorbing it into your body is not efficient. Whereas injecting it really, really is intramuscularly. It's daunting, it's scary, it's not something that anyone wants to have to do to themselves. And that's why you should question whether you want to take anabolics at all. You know, and I understand, look, you're not alone. Like, people have been doing this for, for years and decades. People didn't want to inject, so they took just Anavar-only cycles or Dianabol-only cycles. You know, people have been doing oral-only to avoid the pain of injecting for a long period of time. It doesn't mean it's right, but I understand where you're coming from. But you just need to realise that when it comes to anabolics, especially with recent events, the only way you should be thinking is the most optimal way. The way that's going to cause you the least damage. Because when it comes to Turkestrone and Psalms, if in five, 10 years time, we find out these compounds are extremely damaging, or you find out that you've got health ramifications from them, what are you gonna think about that six pounds of muscle that you gained? Seriously, is that gonna be worth it? If you find out cardering does cause cancer, is that gonna be worth it? For the little bit more you could do on the treadmill? Personally, I roughly know the ramifications of what I take in terms of anabolic androgenic steroids. I also know that I do it in the safest possible manner that you can do them, although in their nature they are not safe. I know the risks. Do you know the risks of what you're taking? Please do like if you enjoyed this content. If you want me to talk more about these compounds individually, maybe do a bit more of an overview, or just delve back into the anabolic androgenic steroid world and give me my honest opinion about other compounds such as growth hormone, primobolin, drop a comment below on what you want to see and give this a like if you enjoyed it. Click subscribe and press that bell so that you'll be notified when I make more videos like this and you can keep up to date with the common sense approach. Consultations are still live. We're still running them for the next couple of weeks up until Christmas. Then we'll take a brief break and we'll be back in January. So the link will be in the description to book a consultation with me to discuss your training, diet, whatever it might be. I'll see you in the next one.